Let me give out the number here today, Saturday, March the 16th, 2013. You're listening to The Rock Newman Show on We Act Radio. Um, we have a subject that I think that um, I might anticipate uh, that uh, you'd be interested in. And um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about what we're going to be talking about uh, this hour. Uh, you can call me at 202 889 uh, No need to be bashful. No need to be nervous. We're just hanging out here and talking about things that we care about. And at the Rock Newman Show, we want to know what you care about. Folks, I said in the last segment it was something uh, I was doing a, a subject matter that was near and dear to my heart. This is a matter that we're going to talk, the matter that we're going to talk about this hour is something that, mm, let's see, this is uh, 2013, 1993, 19, yeah, uh, so about 20, I grew up, for those of you who can see that are watching around the world at www.rocknewman.com or www.weactradio.com, I grew up a fan of the Burgundy and Gold. I grew up in Brandywine, Maryland. I was an insane Washington pro football team fan. I was a, uh, because I grew up in Maryland, I also loved Johnny Unitas as a player for the Baltimore Colts, but I was just an insane fan of Washington's pro football team. And in 1993, I had a conversation with a lady named Kathy Hughes, who she and her husband, back in the late 70s, early 80s, founded WOL Radio. And WOL, as the history is show, will show you, has become Radio One, a powerhouse in the uh, the strongest urban uh, radio network in the country. And Kathy started to share with me information about the nickname of Washington's pro football team. And it was a horror story. I just picture me, a rabbit fan went to the Super Bowls. I was in cold Minnesota, just cheering the team on. One of the great moments in my life was being at RFK Stadium with 50-some thousand people rocking that place against the hated Dallas Cowboys when uh, – when, when uh, Daryl Grant, big number 77, intercepted that ball and waddled into the end zone, man. When John Riggins went around left tackle, and went however far that was, 51, 61 yards. No happier moments in my life. And then I started to become aware of the nickname, Redskins. And where that nickname, from, 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 from whence that nickname emanated, and the horror and the tragedy that Native Americans experienced, with how that name was derived, what I call the genocidal history of the Native American, that this name is very much equated to, very much attached to. And over a period of months, I went from a rabbit, insane, loving fan of this team and the name to understanding that it wasn't right. Now, you know, the Washington Redskins have had some colorful owners to put it mildly, George Preston Marshall, who is probably the most famous of the 
owners of the Redskins, was an avowed, an avowed racist. And just so you know, the subject matter today, I do a, I do a, I do a production sheet. And for, again, for those of you that can see, it says Redskins, and I have an X marks marked through it. And I have folks in studio who can address this issue. But as I did in the last subject, I, I, I want to personalize this. You know, I've seen a lot of commentary. I've seen a lot of writing. There have been a lot of people that have talked about this particular subject. And, you know, it's done so with, 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 with very, you know, so, with a very cerebral approach. You know, they look at the legal aspects of how maybe they can force the organization to take away the name. But I want to make an appeal to the one single individual who has the power to demonstrate some leadership, to demonstrate some character, to demonstrate some real integrity, to demonstrate that you truly care about the fans of the metropolitan Washington area, to demonstrate that you care about your organization and the people that work for your organization, the people that play for your organization. And that is an appeal to the owner, Dan Snyder. Mr. Snyder, I applaud your brilliance as a businessman. You are a marketing genius. I sit and admire the incredible moves that you make as a businessman. I don't think they're always fan friendly because you seem to gouge the customer for every single penny that you can get. And, you know, maybe it would be okay if you had a billion dollars instead of a billion and 200 million dollars. But that's okay. Well, you know, I'm not going to uh, put too much thought into that. The, where I do put the thought and where my passion is so very strong, Mr. Snyder, is that you show a reprehensible arrogance. You show a disdain for decency and what is right. I will appeal to you, Mr. Snyder. Get off of your high horse and those idiotic, stupid defenses that you and everyone in your organization, and I'm talking about Bruce Allen now, because I just, I, just, I just read a comment from Bruce Allen when he was asked the question, well, how would you feel, Mr. Allen, if the team was called the Colored Skins? And after a long pause, according to Mike Wise, who will be joining us momentarily, Mr. Allen said, uh, I, I don't know. And on the... Redskins website, it says something like 81 or 88 other teams in the country have that name. So what? You're in the nation's capital, what is supposed to be the beacon of democracy. And you per perpetrate a racial slur, Mr. Snyder. I want to ask the question, for those of you who are fans, black white, yellow, and otherwise. Let's make this real. Because on the Rock Newman show, you're going to get it real. I would say to you, to my black brothers and sisters, how would you like it if the team was called the nigger skins? To my Chicano brothers and sisters, how would you like it if it was called the gook skins? To my white brothers and sisters, how would you like it if it was called the poor white crackers or the redneck skins? To my Jewish brothers and sisters, how would you like it if it was called the kike skins? You think it's just a name? You talk about honoring, that you're honoring the Native Americans? I've got Native Americans that are sitting with me right now, born Native Americans who have been fighting against injustice all of their lives, Mr. Snyder. Listen to these people, Mr. Snyder. I have Dr. Susan Harjo who has given her life 
trying to get a little bit of equality for Native American people. Got Robert Holden, Native American, who's given his life to the fair treatment of natives. And you, 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 Mr. Snyder, in your ivory tower, look down your nose and have the unmitigated gall to say you're honoring the native people. You are a liar and you are a hypocrite. And we will not rest at this microphone until a decision is made to change the racist, genocidal, disrespectful name. Mr. Snyder, we looked up your home address. We want you to make a change and we want you to come to the table in a peaceful kind of way. And we want to deal with you in a peaceful war, in, in a peaceful way. But you know what, Mr. Snyder? One of our great heroes, Frederick Douglass, said, progress, I'll paraphrase, progress always comes with struggle. It always comes with struggle. And the struggle for this particular, against this particular injustice will take many forms. Right now, the people are sitting around the table who can address the legal aspects, the moral aspects, the peaceful aspects. And then there are others, Mr. Snyder, you need to be aware that are planning other activities that maybe won't be as peaceful, maybe won't be as comfortable. So Mr. Snyder, I appeal to you, just simply, just simply do the right thing and listen to the guests that I have on the show today. First, I want to introduce the panel. It is Dr. Susan Harjo, and let me, she is such a storied and wonderful and accomplished woman. Susan, Dr. Susan, Sean Harjo, Harjo, Cheyenne, and now you have to help me with these names. Hadolgi Muskogee. Hadolgi Muskogee is president of Morningstar Institute in Washington, D.C. She is a poet, a writer, a curator, a lecturer, and policy advocate who has helped Native peoples protect sacred places and recover, 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 recover what was taken in a very illicit, wrong fashion, one million acres of land. She has developed key laws in, four, in five decades to promote and protect native, native nations, sovereignty, children, arts, culture, and languages, including the American Indians, Indians Religious Freedom Act. She received an honorary doctorate of humanities. She is a distinguished indigenous scholar at the University of Arizona, 2008-2013, DeLoria lecturer, the first person awarded back-to-back -back fellowships by the School of Advanced Research in Poetry, and a summer scholar in 2004, first Native woman to be honored, the Montgomery Fellow in Dartmouth College, 1992, past executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. She served as legislative liaison for the Native American uh, Rights Fund in the Carter administration. She is an accomplished, beautiful woman with a very beautiful, peaceful spirit. And she only wants you, Mr. Snyder, to do the right, decent, and fair thing. What will you do? Susan Hartrow, welcome to The Rock Newman Show. Well, I have nothing left to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this and for hosting us. I totally agree that this is um, a terrible name. It's the worst thing we can be called in the English language. It has heinous beginnings in a time when we were commodified. Our body parts and skins and scalps, as they were genteelly called, were commodified and turned in and paid for as bounty for colonies by colonies and by companies and by states. And this was a practice far too close to us in time. 
we're not talking about the beginning of European Native people's contact. We're talking about into the 1900s, our people were treated in this way. And bounties were issued by some of our largest states and some of our smallest. Susan, let me, let me interject. You say bounties were, in, were offered by governmental agencies. Mr. Snyder, governmental agencies of the United States, local, regional, federal, offered bounty. You know what they offered bounty for? For the red skin, for the red skin scalp. You think that's honoring the native American, Mr. Snyder? I'm sorry, Susan, please continue. And there were several ways that the people could establish, the bounty hunters could establish proof of Indian kill. One way is to produce the whole dead body. And another way, which was more common, would be to produce, if the bounty were on Indians, just an Indian scalp of some kind. If the bounty specified a sliding scale for men, women, and children, they would have to produce the genitalia in order to establish whether this was a child or whether it was a woman or whether it was a man. So when people say, well, these bounties never said that word, they only said scalps, they only said proof of Indian kill, that's what it meant. I mean, how else do you establish who is a man, who is a woman, who is a child, as some of the bounties specified. But you don't even have to know that history to know that on its face, that word is discriminatory and disparaging. And it wouldn't fly, you're absolutely right, with any other signifier for whether it's a color or a bad word for any other segment of society. It just would not happen. But we're still at a point where this kind of public outrage against us is still permissible in polite society, and it really should not be. It's wrong, Mr. Snyder. So some of us said enough is enough, and uh, we were looking for many, many years uh, when I was at the National Congress of American Indians in the 80s, we were talking with different lawyers and talking about approaches that we could make through orderly processes to try to get this done because uh, no team owner had talked with any Native people who were opposed to the name and wanted it changed since Edward Bennett Williams in the early 70s. Susan, I'll jump in again. Before we get to sort of the, the, the legal aspects and the, pro and the process, let me introduce the other two uh, individuals who are with us. Um, it is Victoria Phillips Esquire. She is professor, director of the Law Clinic, Washington College of Law at American University, and Robert Holden, deputy director, National Congress of American Indians, and uh, and Choctaw, Choctaw Chickasaw, 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 and calling in <laughs> who was going to be in studio with us, but got caught up in the marathon traffic and wasn't able to get through. Our Washington Post columnist Mike Wise, Mike, Mike, thank you for calling in. Thank you, Rock. Uh, Mike, I'm going to ask you to hold on. I'm going to ask my guest to hold on a moment here. We're going to go to a break and then come back to this all, all, all important subject and struggle. Yes, we're back. The Rock Newman Show here at WEAC Radio. Call in number 202-889-9797. Um, I told you uh, we have Dr. Susan Harjo in Victoria Phillips Esquire, Robert Holden, um, and also online with us, who couldn't make it to the studio, although he gave it the gallant effort, was, uh, is uh, Mike Wise. Mike, again, I want to welcome you to the show. And Mike, I'd like, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that, you know, 
I've seen your writings over the course of you know time now uh, regarding this particular subject. And your most recent article I found very fascinating. I thought you set the stage very properly where you, in your, in your very artistic way, uh, showed what a David versus Goliath battle this is. And, you know, I can appreciate what you said. You'd like to see both sides in this issue. But at the end of the day, you really have to be on the side of what was right and what Dr. Harjo and her team are trying to do. Give us your thoughts, please. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of your show. Uh, I've enjoyed you for a long time. And and especially honored to be, uh, again, a part of a distinguished uh, a panel of, of people that have been fighting this battle much longer than me, and I just happen to be on for the, the, the joy ride. And believe me, as much as the, uh, the struggle for, uh, for abolishing the name uh, has been a headache, uh, for me recently, it feels like people are listening more so now than ever before. Um, and there seems to be uh, some traction. I, I just, you know, Rock, I, I feel uh, very passionately about the issue, um, <clears throat> not because um, just my own upbringing, but also um, it, it's one thing for people on uh, the side of keeping the name, saying, well, you're, you're a bunch of liberal crusading social engineers, <laughs> and and you got a lot of white guilt. That's what this is about. Mm-hmm. And it's another thing to actually come face to face with Native people, American Indians, and have them tell you their stories, like Mr. Holden, like Dr. Suzanne Harjo, like all the people. You know, Amanda Blackhorse is one of the plaintiffs. When they when you see them and you look in their eyes and they tell you the stories of their own persecution, and I can't imagine the people that stood outside the Minnesota uh, Metro Dome years ago during the Super Bowl or, or RFK Stadium years ago and had insults hurled at them when they tried to make notice of this. Um, I, I, it, is a, it is a David versus Goliath battle because the NFL has paid the legal bills for the team um, almost back in 1992 when uh, Dr. Harjo's first lawsuit against the trademark rights of the team well, began and uh, and the the lawyers um, who are very good working for the team are doing pro bono work. Uh, th- this is a multinational conglomerate basically trying to stamp out uh, what is right and <clears throat> and what is underfunded. And frankly, Rock, let's be, like you said in the beginning, straight up, if if this team were called the Blackskins or the Ninja pleasers, or something uh, m- more detrimental. The NAACP would be on Daniel Snyder's doorstep tomorrow, and Robert Griffin the third probably wouldn't play for that team. So, so I, it, 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 it bothers me that because simply because the American Indians in this country do not have the economic or political clout that many other ethnic minorities do, that somehow their cause is not as worthy or just. Are you there, Mike? Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I just thought I was finished for the floor. So I, I guess it didn't. It didn't really. Yeah. yeah no. 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 Yeah. No. 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 You said or, or just you know. And and look. <laughs> and look. I I, I want to be very direct about this. You know, I I I I said and 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 I will repeat about how I as a you know as a business guy myself how I admire Dan Snyder's business acumen. I don't get it here. I don't get it here, and I also don't get it. That Mr. Snyder is a part of a persecuted people. If I understand it correctly, Mr. Snyder is Jewish. And yeah. how he might feel if in this day and time slurs were hurled at him or his children. He's obviously very thin skinned. He tried to get a, 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 a lowly reporter at the city paper fired and tried to run the city paper out of business because he felt some racial insult. 
Yeah, that's the great irony, isn't it? That he essentially will not listen to um, others' concerns in um, in Native America about what they feel is wrong and <laughs> and very unpolitically correct. But the moment the moment the city paper puts horns on him uh, trying to do a send up of a cartoon for an article, that's anti Semitic. I don't get it. You, you, the, that to you bothers you. It's like, do you, you remember Do the Right Thing, Rock? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. The great scene where he has the Korean gross go in the street and go off on every other minority and, and, and everybody else in the film. And then the Italian guy goes in the street and goes off on everybody. And they screened audiences around the world. And what they realized was everybody laughed and went crazy until their ethnicity was made fun of. That's exactly right. It, 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 is to, it is a palpable insensitivity on the, on the leadership. Or I should say, I can't even say leadership of the Redskins, because <laughs> when it comes to this issue, there is an utter lack of leadership. Let me please ask Dr. Harjo and um, uh, Robert Holden, have either of you made a direct appeal to ever meet with uh, uh, Dan Snyder and the Redskins organization and the, and the, you know, I'm going to use that term. I'm going to use that term here because I'm driving a point. I'm driving a point home. Have you ever met, tried to meet directly with that organization or with, uh, or, or, or with the commissioner of the NFL? Because if we, if we're, if we're putting, attempting to put this pressure, make the appeal to Dan Snyder, and he's still being funded by the NFL, which is its commissioner is Roger Goodell, then Roger Goodell needs to become a target of our appeal also. Representatives of the National Congress of American Indians, Americans for Indian Opportunity, the American Indian Movement, and the American Indian Press Association, and others met with um, Edward Bennett Williams when he was the owner in the early 70s. And as I said before, he was the last owner to uh, ever meet with any Native people who opposed the name. We tried to meet with, with um, uh, Jack Kent Cook in the 80s, and he would not even return a call. He wouldn't write, you know, return a letter, wouldn't. Uh, he spoke to us through the press, through a UPI reporter, uh, and report saying uh, there's not a jot whittle chance in hell that the name's going to be changed and because it's a tradition, uh, it would cost too much money, and it's not offensive. <laughs> well, lynching was a tradition. The N-word was a tradi tradition. Uh, traditions can be very, very wrong, and it wouldn't cost money. He would make a fortune off the sale of mem memorabilia, and um, it, it is offensive, and it's not up to an old white guy to tell us what's offensive to Native peoples. You know, you know, the, again, again, folks, the arrogance of an organization that is making money off of a metropolitan population. The arrogance. I want you to listen what Dr. Harjo said and let it resonate also. They won't even meet with these very accomplished, highly respectable people who are trying to create fairness, trying to create justice, trying to create equality, and trying not to be victimized by a racial slur. Dan Snyder, and I'm gonna take it to Roger Goodell also. You don't have the decency to meet and hear from these wonderful people yourself. Who the hell do you think you are, dude? There will be pressure, there will be pressure. Let me go to Robert Holden for a moment. Because what you hear these uh, false prophets talk about is that oh we did a <laughs> this is the this is the joke of jokes there was a study commissioned and an overwhelming overwhelming percentage of Native Americans are oh, they don't feel they don't feel offended by the name you know what I would say this I want to give you an example Alan West and uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in the African-American community, 
they are primo Uncle Toms. And if you went to them to ask them about what you what they thought about the concerns of the black community, you probably would hear some bovine scatology. That's BS <laughs> and something I can't say that I want to say on this microphone. So who the hell did they poll and how legitimate or illegitimate is that so-called poll? You represent a lar the largest consortium of Native American organizations in the country. And it's something that uh, the membership of the organization has long s supported in terms of uh, change. Uh, going back to when, of course, when Suzanne Harjo was executive director, beyond that, it, it's, it's a matter of whose story is it, in whose eyes is this story being told. It's sort of, I guess the analogy I could give is that going up in Oklahoma and, and sitting in a classroom and hearing about um, Native peoples and how we were, you know, in the way and how we weren't using the land and how it should have been taken over by the federal government, <laughs> um, manifest destiny, those sorts of terms, and and you know, being the only uh, Native students in a, in a history class and have all eyes, you know, glued on you in terms of, well, you know, are are you a loser? And so, you know, I, I guess I could probably. Uh, you know, I, I survived those things uh, through my family and, and support, knowing you know who I am and and uh, where I belong, I guess. But nevertheless, the rest of the non-native population, you know, the students, uh, they also were in that class, and so that's how they were taught. So perhaps, you know, it may not be entirely their fault in terms of what their thought processes are of, of, as, as to how they view this and in their own minds. They may be able to try to justify this, but nevertheless, it's our story. Listen to us. You know, you may have been taught differently, but that's what education is all about, is trying to get a better understanding. Of right. Well, if I might interject, um, if, if that's okay, I, I think Mr. Holden puts it perfectly, um, that uh, you, there's sometimes there's no um, insult intended that doesn't mean that you're not, still not hurting the person. When I heard Bruce Allen talk the other day, part of me could identify with him. I'm a, you know, I'm a white male, middle-aged now. I grew up, my father was born in Sparks, Nevada, in Reno. His whole childhood was uh, spent picking up arrowheads that he found um, when he was a boy near the railroad tracks. And he instilled in me this love of the Native people and what they meant to this country. And so the first thing I did, I went to J.C. Penney catalog. I told, I told my grandma, I want a, a poncho of the burgundy and gold uh, Indian logo, uh, you know, for my birthday. And, 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 and sure enough, I had one. And so that was my way of saying I, I really respect and I'm prideful of the, of the American Indian way. What I learned as an adult, though, is, they don't want to see, be seen as the Western movie caricatures out of a John Wayne film. They want us to be seen as doctors, lawyers, curators, uh, students, teachers. Um, and, and until we get away from the idea that somehow that's, you know, well, you've been depicted nobly, you, you've been depicted as a warrior, and, they, and many don't want to be depicted that way, and that's just a small part of their culture from many of them 200 years ago, I, I don't think we're ever going to get it. You know, one of the things I can say is, when I used to watch The Lawn Ranger, my favorite was Tonto. <laughs> so I go way back. <laughs> now, I, 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 you know, I, that portrayal may well have been offensive, but in my, in my uneducated, uninformed years, I mean, I, I, really, did, I really did dig Tonto. <laughs> what, what does Kimasabi mean? I don't know. You got me there. Well, Tonto means stupid. <laughs> wow. Oh, and, and, you you, and you see? You see? There you go, you, right you there. See, and there's Hollywood. And, that's, and that goes to the education again in terms of, you know, not education, but indoctrination. You know, yeah. humiliation and making one feel less than. So they might answer a question like, well, we don't really feel offended by that particular term. Victoria Phillips Esquire. You are sort of the legal person here. 
very, very familiar with the legal struggle of this case. Can you kind of condense for us what has happened, what the legal history has been, and where we are currently? Sure, Rock, Th and thank you for doing this. It's so important. I mean, I got involved in this with my law students at American University to, to show them that the law should be used for, for social justice and for, for doing the right thing. Um, so in a nutshell, legally, um, what's happened here is there is a U.S. trademark um, registered by the Washington football team for many, for many goods and services, those that, that we all buy out there from shirts to entertainment services uh, as football games. Um, and there is a federal law, the Trademark Act, that prohibits the registration of trademarks that are, that are scandalous, immoral, disparaging, basically things that are contrary to, to our moral compass. Um, and what happened when, when Dr. Harjo and, and her, her fellow plaintiffs um, sued, sued to have this mark canceled is our U.S. Patent and Trademark Office found that the mark was indeed disparaging because it Listen brought... Listen up, folks. Listen up. From a legal, the, the legal opinion, the legal opinion on the merits, on the merits of the case Absolutely. were found to be with merit. Absolutely. The United States Patent and Trademark Office, through their tri trademark trial and appeal board, all this legal mumble jumbo, basically it boiled down to the fact that the U.S. government found that this mark brought Native Americans into disrepute and, and a substantial composite of Native Americans were hurt by this. Offended and offended, and they found it offensive, and it brought them down, and everything we've heard, it is, you know, there are surveys that prove everything. So there was battling survey evidence, of course, like there is in every litigation. But, so I got involved in this case and got my students helping, helping here, because then the Redskin entity would not accept that. They have filed an appeal, and it went into the, the D.C. federal courts, and the courts found that they had slept on their rights, essentially. It's a, it's a, a technical legal term called latches. They latches, found right. that, you know, and it's, a, it's an equitable defense. If, and if, if, if someone sues you, but they, they could have sued you 15 years ago, and you relied on the fact that they didn't sue them, courts of equity historically can step in and say, that's not really fair. You know, you slept on your rights. But in this case, um, the court said that, that plaintiffs like, like Dr. Harjo and the others had waited too long since they could have sued uh, when they had reached the age of majority. They had waited too long to challenge this mark. So this is why the newer, newer plaintiffs, Amanda Blackhorse and the younger plaintiffs, have now brought a new case through the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to overcome that objection because they were too young at the time, obviously. They, were, they should not have that defensive latches be applicable to them. And I would like to think that, that the, the, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, which heard the case just, just last week, will once again find, because it's pretty indisputable, that this mark really hurts a substantial when composite. Will, when, will, when will we hear their legal determination? I, you know, I do not know. It's, it's, Suzanne might have a better idea. Well, our attorneys are saying three months yeah. to a year, and it took, in our case, a year from the hearing to the decision date. Um, uh, Suzanne, wh while you have the microphone, would you tell me what the term tanto means again? <laughs> the word tanto in, in Spanish means stupid. Okay. From this day forward, I will refer to Dan Snyder as Tonto Snyder. <laughs> just, want every, just want everybody to know. Okay, uh, we're going to take, take a quick break, and we'll come back shortly. Uh, well, I have a party to go to, so I was wondering if, if we could squeeze something in. I love you. Bye. I love you too, baby. And um, and I and I and I like to think I love what's right and decent and 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 reasonable and fair. In studio with us, Dr. Susan Harjo, 
uh, Victoria Phillips Esquire and Robert Holden all in the struggle for the uh, in an effort to get the name of the Washington football team changed. I have something uh, those of you who struggle with with just loving the team. Hey, you don't have to stop loving the team. I got something real simple for you. Love the team and despise the name because it is a despicable reprehensible name. I say reprehensible name. I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, Vince Gray uh, two days ago, the mayor of Washington, D.C., and that is exactly the term that he used, that the term Redskins is a reprehensible name and absolutely should be changed. Uh, I really, really appreciate you being a part of the Rock Newman Show. I'm going to give this number out one more time, 202-889-9797. Susan Harjo, I'm still in what I did not realize was that you or your organization and the you you all who have been in this struggle never had even had the courtesy of being able to be responded to directly by what I can find what I have no other word that if Daniel Tonto Snyder hasn't reached out to you and given you an invitation to at least explain what you want and why you want it, to give you that just minimal, decent courtesy, there's nothing I could, I have another name. That's cowardly. That's cowardly, Mr. Snyder. You really, really should do better. Susan? Well, we've gone through three owners now, and uh, are, we're on our third. Uh, Jack Kent Cook would not meet with us, and, and we sued uh, in 1992. And then uh, ownership changed. They moved out of Washington, um, and his son took over, John Kent Cook. And when we heard that, Daniel Snyder was coming in and he was finalizing the deal just as we won from the three-judge panel, a unanimous decision in 1999. Um, uh, we wrote to Mr. Snyder and uh, uh, we were very excited because he was young, yes. he was Jewish, he yes. was, and yes. the American Jewish Committee had uh, supported us mm -hmm. and uh, uh, wanted an end to all of these uh, racist stereotypes. And so we, were, we thought that he might be a really reasonable person. So we wrote to him and said that we would, uh, you know, congratulations on your purchase of the team and, and we would uh, be happy to meet with you um, uh, with or without our attorneys uh, to discuss this. And um, in the town where everyone gets a reply of some sort of, uh, you know, dear occupant, thank you for your letter, we never heard anything from him. And uh, again, like Jack Kent Cook, all he did was to say publicly, this is a tradition, it would cost too much money, and uh, we're honoring them, we're not offending them. Absolutely disrespectful, disrespectful. Um, Mike Wise, columnist for the Washington Post, who's really, really done everything that he could do to try to advance this particular cause. Any, uh, any parting words, Mike? Yeah, I just wanna say, that um, I believe the name will change uh, within the next five years, um, if not earlier. I believe that there is uh, such uh, momentum now um, and that um, the parties that be, um, I, I don't even think uh, the, um, the National Congress of American Indians has to do it, but I'm sure their weight behind it would be stronger than anybody's. But there are people in this country that would, love to stand out in front of FedEx and boycott them and tell them to use FedEx and boycott major team sponsors um, to, to demonstrate their support in this issue. And these are people of every color in this world. And, and as those people start getting on board, I believe the moment Dan Snyder is hit in the pocketbook, the name will change. You know, and, and, and it, it just seems so ludicrous that if one thinks that this is inevitable, and I'll tell you what, I think it is. I think it is. I made a, uh, I made a rather substantial bet 
that it would be changed, and I gave it uh, before the um, two thousand. I said before two thousand and uh, before two thousand and twenty. So you know, six and a half years, a little over six years. Yeah. Um, but but I am now thinking, uh, certainly with you, that it will be changed within that time frame. So it as as a person who obviously has you know a fairly high level of intellect. You know, I'm starting to certainly question the moral character. But as a person of fair, a fairly high intellect, not to seize the moment, what he could do to demonstrate some leadership, to de demonstrate some, some compassion and concern, and for demonstrate some, some a sense of social justice, without losing, without losing any money. Here's my premise. Here's my premise. If you announce in 2013 that you're going to change the name for, uh, starting in the 2014 season, that there would be a run on the current paraphernalia and they would sell out everywhere because yep. every fan around the globe would want to make sure they had some of this last paraphernalia. So that's a financial windfall and bonanza. You announce the name of the new team and market it, and people are going to want the new stuff. So there, I don't see, I don't see any diminution of any value by the name change. And so for him to just stand on ceremony, stand in a very arrogant way, in a very disrespectful way of not even meeting these wonderful folks who are trying to do this, and I'm going to tell you something. They. It doesn't fit a lot of his fans. What's starting to happen now is more and more people are becoming aware of this, of the disparaging name and the meaning of it. And there's a little less enthusiasm to talk up, to talk about, you know, my team. Now, obviously there's still rabbit fans that are out there, but within his organization, within his organization, there are people that are uncomfortable when you talk to them about the subject. Now they got a total they have to total company line publicly, but privately they're uncomfortable. Mr. Snyder, you have created a hostile environment here with people that care about your team, that can't not that care about DC's team. That there are people within your organization who are not comfortable you're creating a hostile work environment. Much more importantly, you perpetuate disrespect of a name that was born out of a genocidal, raping, murdering history. Is that what you want your legacy to be? You have an opportunity, Mr. Snyder, to make a very big change to show some leadership for which you will be roundly applauded universally, or you will continue to be the scorn of conscientious people throughout this land. And I can certainly assure you, Mr. Snyder, the one thing I can do as I sit behind this microphone, that you will receive the scorn that comes from here, the disdain that comes from here, until you show some leadership. Your lack of leadership is abysmal. Your lack of courtesy and respect to a population of people that have been brutalized for centuries, your lack of sense and your lack, your, your lack of fairness is absolutely appalling. Why, I want to ask you why. We figured out you're not the only one that can think, you know. You're so arrogant, you might think that way. But, you know, reasonable minds and, and strong business people have figured out you don't lose economically. We know that that's the, maybe the biggest thing in your life, to fatten your purse. You don't even lose there. So what is the problem? When a person practice racist, 
disrespectful behavior, you know what they are? They are racist and they're disrespectful. Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, not someone when someone tells you who they are, when someone shows you who they are, believe it. Mr. Snyder, you've shown us that you are disrespectful and that you are a racist. I appeal to you from the Rock Newman Show and We Act Radio, and on behalf of Native Americans and good thinking people of all stripes, to change your ways. <laughs>